Okay, well, once again, welcome everybody. For those that are just joining, we invite you to introduce yourself by putting your name and your affiliation in the chat. And I think we will get started now with our brief presentation about what Sustainable San Mateo County is all about. So my name is Terry Nagel. I'm the chair of the board of Sustainable San Mateo County and very excited to see so many people here today interested in this topic as I am. I think it's a very exciting one, the intersection of sustainability with the arts. Here's a little uh, blurb about it. You can see that we are also going to be talking about how art raises awareness and spurs positive action during this discussion this evening. I wanted to give you just a brief background about sustainable San Mateo County. We have been around for 30 years now, it seems hard to believe. And when this organization was started, um, the concept of sustainability was kind of an alien concept, if you can believe that. Our vision is that sustainable, that San Mateo County will have a sustainable future for everyone. So we believe in a, a, a really robust approach of what we call the three A E's. It's not just the economy, it's social equity, and it is the environment. And we feel that all three have to be in balance to have a truly healthy society and planet. We do have uh, five key programs. I won't go into great detail, but I do want to um, just touch on each of them. We are really well known for the Sustainability Awards program that we've been doing since 2003, where we call out sustainability champions and really highlight their work. And we also have usually a wonderful awards dinner. We're hoping to go back to an in-person event this year if the virus permits and uh, at that we have a lot of people networking with other people that care about sustainability it's really the go-to event for sustainability folks we also have as you see our happy hours where we're having people come together for an informal discussion about one sustainability topic and that's what we're doing tonight the other three programs that we have are the Indicators Report, the Sustainability Dashboard, and the Sustainability Ideas Bank. The Indicators Report is really a deep dive into one sustainability issue, and we examine it from all different viewpoints. We are working on this year's uh, report right now. It will be focused on electrification, which is one of the fastest ways to address climate change by cutting carbon emissions in buildings. And we invite volunteers to work on that project. We have quite a group going. If you're interested, let us know. Uh, we just started the sustainability dashboard a year ago. And this is an, um, a project that tracks progress every year by the 20 cities in San Mateo County and also the county itself through 30 different metrics that measure sustainability in 11 different categories. We're going to be releasing our first report this summer, and I think you will find it very interesting to see not only how your own city performs, but how the cities compare against one another. And in uh, companionship with that, we want to call attention to our Sustainability Ideas Bank, which has 77 ideas that have been proven successful in cities and businesses across the country, showing how you can accelerate sustainability at the local level. The idea of this Ideas Bank is that if you put into practice an idea that's already been proven successful elsewhere, you can make change happen a lot faster. Just briefly, this is a slide that shows some of the impact that we have. Um, you can go to our website at sustainablesanmateo.org to see our impact in our annual reports and also more information about all of the programs that I just mentioned. And a quick thank you to our lead benefactors for the current year. We um, are very grateful to them for their support of our awards presentation and our auction, which was held earlier this year. 
And uh, there are many other um, sponsors that we would like to commend. You can go to the link at the bottom of the screen to see more about them. Finally, if you would like to support us, we would welcome your gift, no matter how large or small. And you can easily donate to us by texting support SSMC to 44321, or you can go to our website. There's a donate button on there where you can donate. So I also want to say a big thank you to the many people that worked on the happy hours. Kirsten Keith, um, Christine Kolzog, who is our executive director, Jill Reed, who's on this call today, and we're also very grateful to Stella Wetton, who is a, in a um, summer intern who's done a great deal of work on this particular program tonight. We also are grateful to Leanne and of course to Mark Moulton, he's also on this call, and Jacob Reed, who's another one of our interns who's been a great help this summer. So now I'd like to turn it over to Stella. And Stella, would you like to introduce our trivia challenge? Yeah, so um, there's gonna be two questions. The next slide. Um, so the first question is, who is an artist that would use nature to emphasize um, the message they were trying to convey in their works? Um, A, Nicholas Poussin, B, Claude Lorraine, C, Georgia O'Keeffe, or D, Jacob Lawrence? And feel free to just guess in the chat. So you can just put the letter of the winning one in the chat and we'll see how things stack up. I don't know if anybody's watching the chat, if you can get an idea of what the most popular choice was. So are we ready to move on to the answer, Stella? Yeah. Do you think? So if you click to the next slide. Okay. Um, it was a trick question, the answer is all of the above. So all four of these individuals, in addition to many other artists, use nature to establish a theme or convey a message in their paintings. Um, Poussin was known for only painting very extravagant and mesmerizing landscapes in order to mirror like the heavy scenes he would depict. Uh, for example, this painting in the upper left corner. Um, Claude Lorraine was also known for his landscape paintings. Um, that inspired a newfound appreciation for, na the, for natural beauties. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe is famous for her paintings of enlarged flowers and James Lawrence would often incorporate nature in his paintings as well. You click the next slide. <laughs> okay, so the next question is whose sublime painting from the romanticism period in the 19th century depicts icebergs as an external source of danger in a way that directly contrasts with how we think of icebergs today. A, Frederick Edwin Church, B, Vincent van Gogh, C, Leonardo da Vinci, or D, Michelangelo. So, and again, you can put your answer in the chat. That's a beautiful picture, by the way, really lovely. Okay, so. Oh. Can we move to the answer? Yes. Okay. You'd all be correct. It's A, Frederick Edwin Church. Uh, Church's representations of icebergs highlights the fragility of mankind, which is typical of paintings during this time period and period style romanticism. Uh, romantic paintings during the 19th century would use thunderstorms, uh, the winter season in general, ruins or other natural phenomena to depict the fall of mankind. Uh, this is notable because it directly contrasts the way in which paintings of icebergs are used today. Uh, now melting icebergs are more often used to reveal the consequences of carbon emissions. Uh, we look at these icebergs as a symbol of humanity's self-destruction as opposed to an external source of danger. Oh, and I can link later um, the an article that talks about um, how icebergs are. Yeah, or you could put that in the chat when you have a yeah. too. That would be great. Okay, so I think we're turning it over now to Mark Moulton to introduce our first speaker. Great, thanks very much, Terry and, uh, and Stella. So I'd like to introduce Anthony Bianconi 
who is a local artist who is um, also a local resident and uh, has been around for a while. And I'd like to let him give a context for um, what he's been doing professionally for a few years that led to the project, um, The Last of Lions that he wants to present to us tonight. Anthony, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm a local artist, um, environmental, uh, amateur environmental activist and community volunteer. Um, I've been working in the arts um, pretty much all my life, but I started taking it really serious in 2009. Um, a lot of my work has always kind of coincided with um, animals and uh, nature and habitat and recycling. Um, in 2013, I was with the San Francisco Film Festival, which was a huge kickoff onto um, environmental concerns. And with that, I've kind of always just been an artist that lays in the shadows and um, always is waiting for an opportunity to work with my art on, on nature and any way to better the community and environment. And um, so I guess I do a lot of different things. One thing I was doing really heavily before I went campaigning on my, Mount, on my Last of Lions project was working for Stanford uh, radio station where I was a community DJ. Um, I also did some journalism and I would take active participation in helping the local artists. Um, a lot of the things I love about Stanford was that I was getting a chance to be involved in research and science and community studies. And I guess during my time, I realized I had started this project of Last and Lions, where what happened is I found a dead carcass of a deer in my parents' backyard and it wasn't fully devoured. I short story, the smell was rancid. I had to clean it up made me really reflect on what was going on in my backyard and made me ask questions to find out that more questions were me needing to be answered, which led me to realizing that there's a problem in conflict and biodiversity locally and that uh, mountain lions were a precursor and a warning sign that habitat is uninhabitable and that if they're coming into our area, that's a huge warning and red flag. So I started looking into it. Um, show some more slides. You should be okay. through the slides as he's talking. Okay, Thank yeah. So your, your website also, lastoflines.org, which we encourage people to go visit. Thanks. And yeah, it definitely has uh, a short video that will summarize a lot of the issues in a great way. Uh, that might be a little bit better than what I'm doing here. But at the same time, a lot of issues have changed. Um, when I had brought this up to the community, it was kind of um, a little bit early or maybe a little too early to really be considered as seriousness. Um, in the recent years, things have changed drastically. Um, pollution is our leading killer uh, among most things that they're reporting. Um, we have a lot of algae blooms and water because of the climate change. A lot of these climate changes are tied to micro moisture uh, blankets not being there to protect us, which uh, is included with fragmented lands, uh, different uh, diverse species, including plants. Um, so there's a huge seriousness going on. And um, from my own personal stories, I've been witnessing these things happen uh, before clarifying it with research, which I have been um, doing. I've been actively participating with, um, sorry, the, the Semper Virens funds. Uh, the Bay Area Puma Project, uh, Art on the Urge, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, Urban Edge Wildlife, uh, art, on the, um, art, ex uh, art on the Edge of Extraction, and uh, the Codex Foundation I've all been uh, coordinating with and trying to participate and get the best abilities to clarify uh, the issue and the concept. And basically what's going on with mountain lions is they are the keystone that keeps our ecosystem in balance. And without them, they are basically the complete collapse of what's, what's gonna happen for us. And where we can see some of these seriousnesses happening is uh, the climate change recently, we had fires happen in the Edgewood area and in Redwood City recently that caught really close to urban territories, including my parents' house where um, the mountain lion had kind of kicked off all of this and what we, what we find out in science right now is that microorganisms are losing the fight to protect us, not just for plants, but for species. And right now, one out of two infants under the years of one years old are being hospitalized for immune deficiencies, which is um, 
is, is catapulting at a higher rate, rate. And a lot of this is because the climate changing is happening too fast. Heat changes are causing overflow of bacteria and uh, it's just breaking down us on a cellular level. Um, so it, I, I hate to, to say it in dire needs, but we, we are facing some um, seriousness in the, in the collapse of our ecosystem and it's starting at our home in Redwood City. Um, a lot of this, uh, you know, with, with my concept, um, I don't know if you guys can see here, this is a shirt of kind of the, the concept of it. it. I use full scale mirrors and what it does is it creates a corral pattern for the mountain lion which shows it running into each other, fighting for territory on one edge and then vanishing into the quarters on the other. It has bars to represent the unwaving pattern of protection and the fragmented lands. And um, I guess the first time uh, that was kind of coincided with the news was when uh, a mountain lion was corralled in a high school in the Pescadero area. And that had kind of cemented the concept of, of what I've been trying to portray with it. Um, so, um, Mount Lions, with this project, I've been trying to take it to Redwood City to get it approved to be a public sculpture maybe about four years ago. Um, it's been a lot of uh, struggle to get through um, some of the uh, obstacles that a lot of people do when they do projects. Um, a push forward with that would be really helpful or finding locations or funding to really um, get the seriousness of, of the uh, of the sculpture presented to the public and, and help start the education. In the meantime, I do have two mock-up versions that are ready for galleries that I'd love to put in. I have one scheduled to be in the San Mateo County Courts over at the Rotunda Gallery in early of next year. Um, I would really love to push to have them in any galleries possible just to get them out there. And at the same time, I've been working with some companies about eco-friendly concrete and I had been approached to try to make some of these public sculptures out of the eco-friendly concrete. Um, I've also seen some issues with it. It seems like a lot of companies are having uh, design problems where they, um, you know, it's really hard to keep things patterned um, through the cement in the process of printing it. Um, I've been talking to a PhD uh, professor um, at a college and he has been helping guide me on kind of some issues where we could maybe um, remedy that, that uh, ability to use these um, recycled materials, not just for building of houses, but for artists and a way to clean up plastics that would otherwise be sent into the ocean. Um, so that's one thing that um, I'm definitely looking to do. I'm looking for support in uh, construction, finances and location. Right now, the, the last I had a location was at the Garden Motel with uh, developer Viren Patel. Um, and basically, um, he has been running into some issues with um, getting his permits done with the, the building. So it seems like both of us have been kind of in a holdup with more bureaucracy as opposed to um, getting through on the translation of the seriousness of the project. And I'm hoping that eventually we can connect with a location uh, and some supporter that can eventually get us to um, build it and um, start using some of these recycled plastics and, get, and keep them out of the, um, the waterways and environment. Anthony, would you take a couple of questions if people have questions, either put them in the chat or uh, raise your hand? Absolutely, absolutely. Can yeah, I, I was wondering if you've already done a, a mock-up of the sculpture, if you, uh, a full-size mock-up yet? Um, yes, I have two um, full-scale mock-ups. One is out of cardboard and one is, one is out of plastic textiles and PVC pipe. Um, so, so basically what one was done was just pieced together with recycled um, cardboard. The other one was laser cut textiles with uh, zip lines or zip ties to uh, kind of skin, create the outer skin. Mm -hmm. And then the inside is used PVC pipe. And that mountain lion that's on the roadside uh, that was with me in the pictures is the laser cut plastic textile version of it. Hey, Anne, do you have a question for, uh, for Anthony? Certainly. Um, hi, Mr. Bianconi. Uh, Ann Schneider, I'm a councilwoman up in Millbrae where we're just starting to evolve our public art process. Um, I'm wondering for you and any of the other artists that might be around today, if you could send me your information, we have a couple of new biotech firms breaking ground 
uh, where we didn't get public art in. And, and yet our big gateway project has eight new installations. So mm -hmm. we're sort of a chicken before the egg here, but trying to reach out to artists. And I love the nature based. I know we've got some Ramaytush Aloni on the, in the chat. And I hope that we'll have a mural that would be respectful to the Ramaytush uh, on that. So please reach out to me so that I can learn more and figure out how I can help. Um, sure. Could I could I ask real quick, what was your name again? And best Ann Schneider. I'll put my email in the chat. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. I'm the liaison to our Cultural Arts Advisory Committee. And uh, just we're trying to bring art to Millbrae. Although yeah. we don't yet have a budget, we do have on our council goals to put a developer fee to begin to develop a fund that can pay artists for their work. So we're a little, we're not quite there yet, unless our developers agree to do it in their developer agreements. But we have these new biotechs, so let's see what we can do. Thanks a lot, Ann. I really appreciate that. And um, either Terry or or Stella, do you have um, other raised hands or more people that have questions? Uh, there's someone who's asking about if there could be art at Hillsdale Mall. I don't know what the situation is there, but that's certainly a good spot for some. Yeah, we could talk to the Bohannon family about that. They had Benji Bufano uh, sculptures. I don't know if you're familiar with that, Anthony, but they uh, had some beautiful uh, marble and granite uh, over a long period of time. Yeah, yeah, I definitely would be interested um, in all materials. I think eventually in the beginning, we wanted to use bronze. And at the time, it was a little bit more costly than what people would have wanted to use. It was at a really cheap time, it would have been probably doubled or tripled in value from that time. Uh, but originally, we wanted to work in metals. And then it just kind of went into what was more cost effective with budgets. Okay, I see Susie McKee is asking you if you can use older solar panels and repurpose and recut them. Um, yeah, that'd be, that'd be awesome. I'm definitely open to using all recycled materials and I would love to experiment in anything that um, I could have the opportunity with. One of the big things is just not having um, space to work and the funding or just the materials. So if I had a, a place and, 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 you know, places to experiment or a partner that could help me do that, that would be the greatest uh, to kind of get, get these practices and, and breakthroughs. Right, and someone was asking how to contact you. So you might put your email in the chat too for people. That would be helpful. Um, and I think it's time for us to move on to the next. It is, speaker. yes. I, I, did, I did notice, Anthony, that, that uh, there folks are saying that on your site last of Lyon, the email for you is not working. So if you would be kind enough to put it, the one that people should use in the chat, that'll help them connect with you. Yeah. Now, I, now I'd like to introduce Joshua Harrison. Um, Josh is the co-director of the Center for the Study of the Force Majeure out of the United, University of California, Santa Cruz. And um, he's coming to us this evening from his home in New York City. Um, mm -hmm. Josh, take it away. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you, Terry and uh, Stella and Mark for inviting me to this, uh, this event. And I think um, two things. The, the, the issue of, of art and ecology, I think, is a really big one and very personal to me since my parents more or less founded the ecological, modern ecological art movement uh, about 50 years ago and have been working extended, you know, very diligently ever since. And they've been working on California artwork since 1977 in a piece called Sacramento Meditations, which took nine different landscape maps of the state functioning around different elements of watersheds and asked the very same question we're gonna ask in the piece that I have here today, which is how does this state that's semi-arid and very populated survive and look forward into the world in front of us. Um, but before I get there, I just want to say, you know, the Center for the Study of the Force Majeure is a uh, institute that was sort of based on some of the core premises of 
environmental art and, and when our main position statement is right here we're not apart from nature we are a part of nature we as human beings and that's a central contradiction of modern life it was uh, gradually introduced to us in some sense by the exact problems we face today which is the um, industrial age where basically cheap energy has has given us a big shield between where we are and, and the world around us and our challenge as people as activists and artists is really to to bridge that gap and bring us back into that universe. And we call ourselves the Center for the Study of the Force Majeure. Force Majeure is a legal term, uh, sometimes described as acts of God. If you have an insurance um, uh, contract for your housing, you know what force majeure is. It's basically something that the insurance company says, well, it's out of our hands. We can't control it. And we look at it ecologically to look at the issues that pe we as people have done, the vast extractions of coal and energy and, and fossil fuels and pumping into the atmosphere that come up with outcomes that we can't control. And so that's our premise is what does that mean? And then the last piece on sort of that is we function, and this is where one of the questions that was posed in the early discussion here was, how can artists work ecologically? How does it mean? What does it mean for art to function and um, in an ecological way? How does it happen? How does people do? What kind of work is available? And one of the one of our premises uh, is we sort of look at that as three fold premise. We look at first we start with a provocation. We hope that provocate and in this case. The provocation that I'm going to share with ahead is what if we stopped thinking about controlling sea level rise, but actually let sea level rise work as it must? And what does that mean for a state like California? And what in particular does that mean for the extended bay elements of, of the San Francisco? Um, and yeah. then we have, okay. You can just call for the slides as you need them, Josh. Okay, sure. Okay. We can move. So we can move there in a second. Okay. Um, and then the last piece of that is implementation. So we, we see, and just to stay back with art, art has been, you know, this element of human life. It starts, you know, it's as old as now 75, 80,000 years now they've dated back the first cave painting. So literally as long as there's been any recorded media of any kind, if it's 80,000 years, it's even older than the song cycles of the Aborigines at this point. So it's clearly an essential element of, 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 of human nature across the planet, everywhere we go. Um, but art means the different things at different times. And in many, many cultures, the artist is not singled out as an artist per se. They may be singled out as a craftsperson. And today we have art spent a lot of the 18th and 19th century in Europe, especially in, in the United States, we've created art as a discipline increasingly separated out from the rest of life. And I think the act of creativity in art brings, makes that contradiction something that's relatively easy to, to control um, and to work back. So if you think about a piece of Greek pottery or a, a Washoe fireball. A Washoe fireball is an example I really love to use because that's a basket. It's woven out of a certain kind of reed. It's designed to carry a live coal from one campsite to another. If you look at it in a museum, it's an exquisitely elegant piece of craftsmanship, but that person who made that bowl understood biology, botany, fire science, weather patterns, understood when to pick, when to plant, what food needed to happen, what material science, you know, all of these massive disciplines, but they were actually part of a unified discipline. If you wanted to make this kind of a bowl, you needed to intuitively understand all of these things. In other words, it wasn't one thing. The artist was able to do many things. And we hope, and in ecological art, and then the point is, it's really looking at systems, it's looking at how things go, an artist's perspective, artist's ability to unify and design, artist's techniques of collage, of integration of many different things are all critical to looking at the world a little differently than we have in the past. And so I think 
That's the piece. And, I, and one of the ways we uh, do that is what we call a metaphorical flip. And this is where the base of San Francisco, and the base of San Francisco says, essentially, um, what happens if we really look at the 10 to, you know, the three to four meter sea level rise or the 10 to 15 foot rise in the water's height that we are now expecting in the next 50 to 75 years, unless, of course, uh, the systems break down more rapidly and the glaciers melt because prior to the last ice age, we really had a 200 foot sea higher cell level of sea, which is an entirely unimaginable experience for us today. But let's stay within the presentation and say that the you know, the Gulf Stream doesn't break, that the North Pacific gyre doesn't disappear, that, you know, the weather patterns in between the Amazon and the Pacific sort of hold more or less within they are. And so the sea level rise will be within the 8 to 15 foot range in the next 40 to 75 years. So the next slide, please. Um, the, main, the main thing that that we think of when we look at our metaphors and we use metaphors and poetry as a sort of a tool to simplify and synthesize language. And for here, I just like to say, when we look at water, we look at watersheds, one of the basic tools we look at is this phrase, we like, you know, only a fool picks a fight with the ocean. Wise folk dance with the rising waters. So why are we fighting water? Why aren't we working with it? And that's really the key for all of our water work and all of the work we do with watersheds and with fire as well, forests. Next slide, please. So very, this is just a very quick set of uh, images. Here's an aerial view taken around 20 years ago of the bay. Next slide, please. That's at sea level more or less as it is now. Here we are with a uh, 30 meter, about a one foot rise. Next slide. Here we are with a three to five foot rise. This is assuming that, that there, are no imp there are no impediments to the way the water moves. Next slide, please. Can you tell us about what year we're talking when? You these are, well, you know, the predictions are always a little hazy, but these are, 35, 40 years for a one foot rise, could be twice that. Uh, it could come, could come much more quickly if we lose, you know, we're, right now there's water slippage in all of the major ice shelves. Mm -hmm. There's, that is to say there's water melted underneath a third of Greenland. It's underneath one fifth of the, Antarct of the Antarctic ice shelf. The, 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 uh, North, you know, the polar, the Arctic Ocean is no longer freezing solid. Um, it's, you know, it's so we are in a moment where we don't know what it's really, it's really important. Not only do we not know, human agency is making it worse, not better. You know, we have, we have a, the best science on the planet on the IPCC, thousands and thousands of researchers have been spending you know, the last 40 years trying to figure out what's going on. And every single report they give is worse. Mm -hmm. Every time they issue a report, it's not better, it's worse. And we have yet to meet any of the national deadlines. If you notice, we just had a Supreme Court decision that said, gee, the, even the limited efforts that our own environmental organizations are doing on the national level, cannot actually behave as the way they were asked to do by Congress because reasons. Okay, so um, that is to say within the IPCC, as of last October, we had seven, eight years to change the carbon load significantly. Conceptually still doable, conceptually very much still doable, but will we do it? So I think it's a really good question to know what, you know, but the, the answer is every single time we take a sober look at where we are, it's harder and harder to get to where we want to be. Okay. And that applies. So we can go to the next slide and it just sort of, oh. say, okay. So the, the really key piece here, let's go to the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the outside edge of, prediction within for the next hundred years. So this is four to 600,000 acres overflowing back into this, the San Joaquin Sacramento River Basin. 
So one of the questions we asked, this is the provocation, is why, go to the next slide, please. So, uh, you know, why do we try to maintain what we see here, given the vast force of water that's going through? What would it look like, among other things, and there are many, many things to do, if we danced with the rising waters and we let that go through? Um, one of the things that would happen is that we'd have this giant marsh, this giant estuarial lagoon. And one of the interesting things about estuarial lagoons is they're way more bioproductive than dry land and semi-arid desert. In fact, they're among the most biologically alive uh, areas of the planet. So why not, in fact, farm fish, and farm, not farm fish, farm the, um, the, the crustaceans, the clams, the bivalves, the smaller down below the life web animals that would grow naturally in a marsh and in a wetland and which we could actually harvest without damaging the ecology of the wetland, 30% of the abundance, that would potentially equal the same protein value that four, six, four to 600,000 acres of farmland would. So, so that's a two minute warning, Josh, if we're going to get any okay. questions. I will, I will leave it. I will leave it at that. Well, that's the question. The next slide is, the next slide sure, is go ahead. another go ahead. Good, good question. Oh, yeah. Beginning and, and then this following slide. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, so let's look. At, so right now, right now, the general plan around New, around San Francisco, and it's the same general plan that New York has, another big harbor city, is to hire Dutch engineers to figure out how to keep everything dry and minimize the impact of water rise. Uh, and our suggestion is that's probably the wrong way to think. Look, so that's probably not. And behind that, the Dutch aren't even doing that in Holland, in the Netherlands. So, Dave, so they're, they're selling that skill, but they're not actually applying it to their own homeland. So we, okay. we do have some questions. And Please. Um, maybe um, somebody who can read the chat can, can uh, take them off for me and ask them, Stella. Um, or we can go to the person who's asking them. Okay, yeah, what if people uh, raise their hands? Do you know how to use the reaction button at the bottom of your screen? And then we can see you. Close the chat. So I'll look again, okay. Your comments about the IPC, IPCC report here. Um, okay. So Anne, do you want to make a comment about your remark, the colonialism and materialism? Thanks, Terry. No, I think that was just a chat. My question to the speaker is, how do we take what you're doing and bring it down to the local government level? Um, that's a wonderful question. And I think part of, part of the reason Mark invited me to this event was to start exploring some of that conversation. The challenge of, of doing a bioregional solution like something of dealing with the bays needs to be is that every local government by itself is not going to be able to do very much because they all need to work collectively. And it, if anything, this would hopefully this kind of work would start to bring back the sort of regional collective action because this is a collective of action issue at its finest. And local governments need to be part of it, but they also need to be cooperating because if, you did, if one government agency decides to do one thing and another one decides next door to do something different, that can pose, you know, that, that can basically break a system. So I think it's a great question and I would be happy to explore it if, uh, if that happens. Okay, and Chris had a question. Chris Florkowski, how do you encourage the impacted communities to retreat? Says uh, this hasn't gone well in Pacifica thus far. Again, I think that's a really important uh, question. We haven't really taken the issues seriously enough at any level. 
uh, on all of these things where, you know, we are as, you know, there's, there, I, th I think I saw something in the chat about, is this a universal human problem or is the agency list more connected to uh, capitalism and other things? I think that's a very relevant question. Uh, there are certainly examples across history of societies that have worked in tandem and in very elegant response to environmental issues. And there are also plenty of other uh, stories around that history tells us of of native and indigenous societies that have utterly failed, uh, whether it's the Mayan civilization, whether it's the Puebla people in the Southwest. So I think there's a lot of, uh, it's a hard one. I mean, it's a hard one because it's a social question of understanding. And we have a lot of people whose money and whose work and whose life's work involves not understanding the impact and the important. And also we haven't really made the argument effectively about why you need to uh, strategically retreat. And by that, I mean, we have not paid the social cost of doing nothing. We keep pushing the cost of doing nothing out. If we in fact accepted the cost of doing something and paid for people to relocate as we should, if we want to actually have in this society a different solution, that would help. It would also help if insurance required rebuilding differently, not rebuilding the same. Uh, that's starting to happen, but we still have flood insurance on a federal level that is still pushing rebuilding in place as the only thing they'll find. So it's a, uh, so there are, there are very specific strategic elements in our behavior that we can do governmental, quasi-governmental uh, responses, but they all have to take seriously, the high cost of doing nothing. So Stella, you had some slides, I think, that we want to walk through to try and give people some other ideas about art and eco-art. And, um, and then we'll get back to a group discussion and questions and answers for both of the artists. Right. So um, maybe click a few slides ahead. Just one more. Um, there. So here, there, I listed three other artists that similarly to the artists that spoke today and that used their work to promote sustainability and raise awareness. So if you click to the next slide, um, there we go, there's the image. So these two artists are from Marin and they use waste that they find in the Point Reyes National Seashore um, to create pieces of art. Um, these pieces uh, promote ocean conservation and emphasize the consequences of throwaway culture. And then if you click to the next slide, this is a piece by um, Anthony Goldsworthy. Um, this clay installation aims to simultaneously depict drought and rising sea levels. You can see the um, nature of this uh, structure it sort of looks like a dried out piece of land and then in the background there's the oceans to kind of emphasize rising sea levels and then if you click to the next one um so this is another piece these artists and researchers use synthetic biology to predict and resynthesize uh gene sequences um identical to that of extinct species of flowers in order to encourage the preservation of current plant species. And these are all just a few examples of uh, art that is used to, you know, as a powerful, not only as a powerful knowledge dissemination tool, but also as a way to speak to people and encourage them to take action. Um, and so then- at this point, we want to invite more questions for our speakers and comments. And again, if you can, put your question in the chat or raise your hand with the reaction button. We can call on you and let you speak. I saw someone had a question about insurance. Um, yeah, Belinda, would you like to ask your question of the group? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, how, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. great question. Um, 
Thanks. Um, I, I have long thought that when the insurance industry really gets on board with it, that's when things will change. Because the only reason we've been able to keep going as we are is because of insurance. You know, when, th when something happens, people can rebuild. And I, I still don't understand how Florida is around, but I think <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, the insurance industry has a lot of power to, for making um, meaningful change and for getting people to actually make that change, not building on floodplains, not, you know, just not insuring certain aspects. And I, it seems like the city government or the county or the state could somehow work with the insurance companies to, you know, kind of try to craft um, well, Belinda, that actually ties in, you know, Josh has been talking about the water work from the Center for the Study of the Force Majeure. Mm -hmm. You might just give us a two minute uh, rundown, Josh, on the fire work that you're, that you're doing also. Um, Belinda, you're absolutely spot on. Um, there really are only two industries uh, which have substantial cash deposits and which think actuarially, that is to say, over the long term about costs and benefits. One is pension and the other is insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and to your general question, both the insurance companies and more importantly, what they call the reinsurance companies, those are the companies that backstop insurance companies, have been tearing their hair out about climate and climate issues and how they're going to pay for it for 35, 40 years. And if you look at their documentation, if you look at the annual report of Swiss Ray and Munich Ray, which are two of the biggest, um, they are truly, truly sensitive to what it's going to mean. Their actions, however, speak much less eloquently. Um, in the fire process, uh, uh, you know, one of the uh, things I've been doing for a number of years is working with insurance or, or working to sort of answer the question of why fire insurance is so poorly understood and so poorly managed by the, by the insurance companies and how is that going to change? And the same thing holds for flood insurance. And, and you won't be surprised that there's a big chunk of it that's strictly political. Your question about flood insurance is we, we let the federal government define uh, the parameters of flood insurance. And even though they all know they shouldn't be refinancing re, uh, buildings in place in flood damaged areas, every time they try to change the law, it gets into, you know, the, the uh, political process intervenes. And, and uh, you know, because a lot of people are willing, you know, are really unhappy about leaving their homes and are really unwilling to accept the fact that they have to. So it doesn't, so the law itself is still far from ecologically well-developed. In fire, the, the, there's, a, there's a small and a, there's an immediate and then there's a larger problem. Fire, the immediate problem is that um, no individual insurance company in California actually puts enough claims on the ground that they actually have a regional interest in focus. So they're just caught by the fact that their expenses have tripled and, and they're 150, 200, 300% above what they're, what they're getting in, what they're paying out, and they just wanna leave. And the state version of uh, insurance, as many, many of you may have it, is inadequate to rebuilding a house in the Wooey or any of the fire restricted zones. So the question really is about changing what insurance means in a dangerous area. And there's some pretty interesting thoughts about what that can mean that can bring communities involved, but it's all about what I said before, who's willing to accept the high cost of doing nothing? Who's willing to face that and upfront pay for the, the, the not the research, the financing it takes to do that they all, you know, inevitably people want to just sort of try to muddle through. And that's what we're seeing more than, more than fixing it. But there are some pretty good ideas on the table and there are a lot of people thinking about it. 
And I see a couple of comments in the text that lead me to believe that folks have started to look at those issues when they're traveling to Australia and um, that essentially we're, we're all noticing how, how stuck we are in California, New Orleans, various other places, New York City. Um, mm -hmm. would, we, um, would we like to uh, do a little wrap up maybe with, with Anthony and, and Joshua to let them uh, inspire us as we go out and then Terry will do a closing. Um, Anthony, uh, it seems to me that you feel pretty passionately about this project that you're working on. Uh, have you gone ahead and put your email where people can reach you? And, uh, and are you really aware of the opportunity that's been offered to you by the councilwoman from Milbrae? Um, yes, yes. I, I believe um, an opening to materialize the project has been, um, been there and I would love to take any contact and connect in any way to get this this started. It's I, I really wanted to start it a long time ago and if it can it can happen as soon as possible I think that's the purpose and the dream come true and um, so I, I really appreciate all the support and opportunities available right now. I'd, I'd love to just spend everything I can to get this project off the ground. Okay and I want to thank Carol Drake for her comment uh, that that link to to Jane Goodall, of course, is a, a very inspirational leader globally. Uh, Josh, is there something that you'd like to say to the group here besides we got to get our act together with the one um, people and all the jurisdictions? Sure. I think uh, I think there's a question in the chat that I see from, from Ann Schneider. Can art be used to bring people together to enjoy the art and give specific actions individuals can take? Not sublimely, but specifically. I think that's a wonderful way to close. There, there is a great tradition, a rich tradition of doing that in the art world, of doing collective engagement that you think of the 60s and the happenings movement where people were brought in to just not even knowing what they were doing to do various kinds of community activities. I think you saw somebody collecting uh, detritus off the beach to turn into artwork. There are all kinds of things that merge social and community action together. Um, I'd leave one example that's more, uh, uh, or it's called uh, about 25 years ago, I did uh, something called the uh, Spoils Pile Restoration Project in a park in Upper New York near Niagara Falls, where we had a community-based restoration of a 60-acre spoils pile about a, three miles from Love Canal. And we were able to, over three years, with the parks, the eight, seven nearby counties getting their leaf waste moving with 10,000 trucks of clean earth, that, dump loads of clean fill that came in from burying power lines in the Niagara Mohawk Power Department and the Boy Scouts, the uh, Girl Scouts, the vast, you know, the local Sierra Club planting uh, local meadow flowers and, and wildflowers and seeds. We were able to turn a toxic, nearly uh, impossible to fix, you know, largely sulfite based spoils pile into a garden and a meadow that could be part of a, an ordinary park experience. And that I think is the kind of, one of the ways that one could imagine um, doing collective action that's both productive, meaningful uh, and something that you can really own locally. And I think also to go to um, the chat and to look at, at Reed's question about the psychological effects of seeing people uh, essentially fiddle while Rome burns and the, the great danger we're putting ourselves in. I think what Josh is talking about is very meaningful. I think we can organize uh, locally, uh, have events and see that all of us are concerned about this. And um, that's part of the reason that we wanted to have this session uh, be about the arts. Maybe Terry, it's time for you to wrap it up. Yeah, I will do so. Thank you, uh, Mark, and thank you to our speakers. We really appreciate this very provocative discussion about art. I think 
it's another example how of how people can come together and make good things happen. And that's what we're all about with Sustainable San Mateo County. So here's how to get in touch with us. The main email is advocate at sustainable San Mateo Dot org. And we do invite people to volunteer for our key programs, which are the sustainability ideas bank, which is finding new solutions that cities and businesses can copy to become sustainable faster. We have our annual indicators report, which is focusing on the topic of building electrification this year and how it impacts San Mateo County. And of course, we also have our dashboard. This is a new project that is measuring sustainability in the 20 cities in San Mateo County and the county itself. We want you to put the date of August 10th on your calendar. That's going to be our next happy hour in August. And we will um, be letting you know when and what the topic will be. So thank you all for coming. We appreciate your participation. We appreciate your enthusiasm, and we also urge you to get involved. That's how you make good change happen. Thank you, everyone.